So um, I'd say if you haven't done so already, take a moment and download and install SuperCollider. Show of hands, who's, who's got it installed? Fantastic. OK. So when you open up SuperCollider, you, this is the first thing you see, a beautiful big blank canvas. Um, this big open space on the left is the editor, the text editor of the IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. It's basically a program that is part of the main download of SuperCollider, which it's where you write your code, it's where you execute your code, it's where all of the, the work happens. So that's the, uh, the left area here. And the, the top right is the help browser. And this is actually a little uh, very simple miniature web browser that uh, goes to the, the documents page on the, the main SuperCollider website. So these are also accessible if you go to supercollider.github.io and then at the top where it says docs, this is the exact same thing. So these are also accessible on the web. Uh, you can right click and change the font size a little bit if you like. It's usually a little too small for me. And then in the bottom right is the post window. This is where Super Collider talks back to you. When you run code, it will uh, print the value returned by the code that you run. If you try to evaluate invalid code, this is where error messages get printed. And on the topic of error messages, I just want to make it clear to everyone that getting error messages is a very normal, frequent, common part of using Super Collider. I still get tons of error messages because I make mistakes all the time. And when you do see an error message, I think the first step is to not panic and to just kind of read, you know, maybe not read all of it, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, just take a moment to read the very top or the very bottom. It's 99.9% .9 of the time an error is the result of some incredibly simple, easily fixable thing. You forgot a semicolon, you put a decimal point in the wrong spot, you're missing a comma, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, so many errors are, they, they induce panic, but they're incredibly simple. <coughs> so these docklets can be moved around. If you grab the sort of grayish area up here, you can click and drag and, you know, tuck them in various parts of the, uh, um, of the IDE. You can undock them, which just lets them float around, and you can detach them, which makes them into a, their own separate window. So you can tuck them away other places. If uh, you accidentally or intentionally close them, you can go up to View, Docklets, Help Browser, and there we have our Help Browser back. You can dock it back in where it goes. So you can sort of customize the appearance a little bit. Um, let's see, Mac, 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 Windows, Windows, Windows. Okay, uh, it's a pretty uniform experience, which is one of the things I really like about Super Collider. It runs on all three main platforms, Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously I've got Mac here. So some things I say are just things that I'm in the habit of saying. Like when I say the command key, what I mean is for you guys, uh, control key, right? But um, you can go to the preferences dialog. I think this is an edit preferences for Windows, uh, wherever you normally find application settings. And there's some things you might be interested in here. Um, uh, particularly in the editor panel, uh, there are some uh, behaviors you might want. Uh, eh, maybe not so much, actually. But uh, f font and colors, this is where you can pick uh, your favorite font. I highly recommend a monospaced font. Highly recommend using monospace. Uh, so you can show only monospaced fonts. And I have a font called Source Code Pro, which is a Google font, but uh, it's really just a matter of taste. And I'm using the default color scheme. Uh, some people like to use some sort of dark theme. Dracula is kind of nice. You know. It would be nice if the help file also followed the color scheme, but it, it doesn't because it's an external website. Uh, so feel free to customize to your heart's content. So the post window, um, there's a couple of hotkeys, so actually just one in particular, which I, I memorize, and that is the hotkey to clear the post window, which should be by default shift command P or shift control P on Windows. So if you hit that, you should get a nice clear post window, uh, clean think. 
And also, I think by default, the text does not wrap. Um, so if you have some really long error message in the, in the post window, personally, I don't really like having to scroll horizontally to read it. Um, but it's up to you. But I, 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 it just sort of looks ugly to me when the text doesn't wrap, so I like to wrap it. But there's, it's really up to you. <coughs> OK, let's talk about writing and evaluating code in Super Collider. So we type our code here. Uh, and let's just start with something incredibly simple and just write out a mathematical expression like um, 7 plus 32. Right. So uh, numbers are numbers, the usual ma mathematical symbols, plus minus the asterisk is multiplication, the forward slash is division, there's lots of others. Um, you should get in the habit of ending every statement of code with a semicolon. The semicolon is the statement delimiter. It tells the interpreter, this is the end of a statement. And it's a, wow, is that thunder? Holy moly. Yeah, so um, uh, without semicolons, it's imagine reading a book with no spaces, no commas, no periods, no, no nothing. Just like letters, 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 letters. letters right? It's, it's uh, virtually impossible to parse. And the similar thing with a semicolon. You've got to end your, uh, your lines with a, uh, with a semicolon. So to evaluate a single statement of code, uh, we hold shift and press enter. And in the text editor, you should see the code that was just evaluated briefly flash orange. And in the post window, you will see the result of your evaluated code. Uh, SuperCollider is what's called an interpreted language. And so this means the act of evaluating code is a real-time dynamic experience, where it's, it's very common to have lots of chunks of code in one super collider file, and you sort of run one, then you run the next. Maybe you go back and change something and run the first thing again, and really just kind of jump around. Uh, super Collider is pretty well optimized for a practice called live coding, where you're actually making the music as it's happening and changing things in real time. Uh, this is, uh, in contrast to lots of other programming languages, where you write the entire program and then send it off to the compiler, where it is uh, parsed and turned into machine level code and you know and so that's that's not what super collider is so um uh it's maybe a little bit different for some but i think it's kind of essential for an audio programming language to be able to work with it in a very nimble dynamic way right so um that's uh that's a single line of code is evaluated with shift enter um super collider is pretty not picky about white space so the spaces you know really really actually don't matter quite a lot this is a perfectly valid it looks weird but there are some very very rare exceptions where super collider is picky about white space but for the most part you can do spaces and um, return characters um, but let's let's do something a little bit more um, uh, sophisticated let's say we want to start with some number and do several operations to it in a row and this is a very common thing to do in programming languages because you have some uh, unit, uh, some processing unit, some thing which performs some task. And that task is made up of several steps. And you like to encapsulate that as a single chunk of code that can be reused uh, like that. So let's, let's say we start with, um, I suppose in order to do that, we, uh, we come across the need to use named containers, also called variables or um, I guess mostly called variables, right? If we have a number, we want to add 32, subtract 12. It's a terribly redundant operation. All right, let's, let's just make up something here. So we, we want to start with some number. And we'll say number equals 6, semicolon, uh, number uh, uh, equals number times 4, uh, number equals number minus 1 semicolon. And so we already have a couple of problems here. Uh, first of all, shift enter only evaluates the current line. And when I say current line, I mean the line that the cursor is on. So shift enter all you like, uh, you will not be able to evaluate all of this at once. Furthermore, we're getting an error message in the post window. And it says variable num not defined. So in Super Collider, when we want to use a named container, to keep track of something so we can you know, manipulate it in sequential fashion, 
uh, it either has to be declared, and that is done using a var statement. So var num, all right, so that's, we declare it, but we still have the same problem. So uh, what we need to do is evaluate all of this code in one go. And there are two ways to do that. The first way, which I don't recommend, is to highlight everything and then hit shift enter. And that works. Now shift enter, if nothing is highlighted, shift enter will evaluate the line the cursor is on. It's the line that is unbroken by return characters. If something is highlighted, that's what will be evaluated. So if I just highlight the number six and press shift enter, we get the number six. Right? So it's a very dynamic experience evaluating code in Super Collider. Uh, the, I don't, the reason I don't recommend shift uh, highlighting is because sometimes you have a uh, code which is thousands of lines long. And it's really, well, I mean, you can do command A in that case. But sometimes you have a subsection of code which is hundreds of lines long. And you need to go find it and click and drag and the, the thing scrolls and it's just very annoying. The much better way to evaluate a multi-line chunk of code is to enclose it in parentheses with each bracket on its own line like this. Uh, there is some flexibility in the details of the syntax, but this is what you see in all the help files. This is what you see in example code, and this is what I recommend. If there is a chunk of code that you want to evaluate in one keystroke, enclose it in parentheses like this, and then we use a different keystroke. We use, uh, for Mac OS, command enter, for Windows, control enter. And so that will get the job done. And so what we have here is a small block of code uh, where we declare a variable called num. And then within the context of the code that we evaluate, we are allowed to use num. Right? If we go outside of here and you know, several seconds later we say, by the way, what was num again? We're not, it's, it's gone. It has evaporated. It's, it's uh, passed back into the code ether. So um, they are, these locally declared variables are only valid within the scope of evaluation, within the scope of the enclosure in which they are declared. Um, as an alternative to local variables, you can, there, you have a couple of options for so-called global variables. Uh, and these, this is a way of creating a named container which can be used inside and outside of the enclosure in a different file. Um, it's, it's basically permanently remembered. And uh, one way to do that is to precede the name with a tilde. It'll change color. And this is perfectly valid as well. And you can see num is remembered. I should, I should be responsible here and put a semicolon there. Right? Uh, so preceding a name with a tilde is actually creates something called an environment variable. Technically not global, but for our purposes, we can very safely treat these as global variables. Even if I were to open up a new, uh, a new document here and say, what is the value of num? It's still 23. So it's sort of across the entire platform uh, permanent. And, you know, of course, we can continue manipulating it, but um, we don't have to declare it. The other option, which I think is kind of messy, is to use uh, one of the 26 lowercase alphabetic characters. So the tilde option, these are environment variables. The letters A through Z, when used in this way, are called interpreter variables. And they are here as a convenience. For us, the user, if we just want to do something super quick, we just want to test something out and we need a name, we can just use a letter. The only thing to keep in mind here is that you should probably avoid using the letter S. S as in snake. Uh, because by convention, S is reserved uh, when you launch Super Collider. It, it keeps a reference to the audio server, which is a part of Super Collider. It's the engine which processes all sound. And if you use S for something else, then you've overwritten it. And then it's, you can no longer use S to access the server. 
this is just kind of, um, and there's, there's lots of reasons you can say this is bad practice. It's just n is meaningless. You know, it's, it's good when variable names are self-documenting, like num or number or value or, you, you know, you call something the name that gives meaning to it. But um, single character letters are ultimately fairly meaningless. <clears throat> Let me see. Where should we go from here? Okay, so let's let's say we have this function, this sort of arbitrary math function, and we'd like to be able to encapsulate that in some sort of object that we can call and reuse freely. Right now, we'd actually have we, with the, with the current state of things, we have to go back up and click on it and change the numbers, and you know if we want to do different numbers and run it again, run it again, and we certainly don't want to be copying and pasting this everywhere because that's very inefficient. Usually in programming languages, if you find yourself copying and pasting something over and over again, you should stop and think to yourself, okay, I'm doing this wrong, right? Uh, and so what we're talking about here is an object called a function. It's a, a special kind of object in SuperCollider which uh, basically defines code but doesn't actually evaluate it. It's, it defines the code and then you can evaluate it as many times as you like later on. And uh, a function is delineated with an enclosure of curly braces. We're going to keep our parentheses, too, because that's what allows us to evaluate this in one keystroke. So we're going to make a sort of secondary layer of brackets, uh, the curly braces on the inside. And uh, SuperCollider does automatically indent, but only if you're sort of typing in one go. If you paste, the indentation might get messed up. So what I usually do to indent is Command A, select everything, and then just press the Tab key, and it will just fix all your indentations. It might seem like kind of a minor thing, indenting, but when you have complex code, the indentations really help with readability, because you can, you know, imagine never using the return character, you know, and so everything is just one long line. I mean, return characters are helpful for spacing things out and readability. Indentations are useful in the same way. Uh, and we're going to call this. Um, tilde func. So we've named this function func. And so when we have a function, we can evaluate it by passing it the value message or value method. Uh, SuperCollider exists as objects, various types of objects, and we work in SuperCollider. We manipulate data in SuperCollider by passing messages to objects. And that syntax looks like this, something dot something. The first something is the receiver of the message. And the thing after the period is the message itself, or the method. And so in this case, func is an instance of a function, and value is a method that is defined for functions. So when we do this, the code in that function is evaluated. And the value that is returned is whatever the last line of that function produces. In other programming languages, you actually have to explicitly say return num or something like that. Or you have to say this is what comes out of this function. With functions in SuperCollider, that happens automatically. Whatever the last line evaluates to is the value returned. Which means we can actually take this internal calculation and store it outside of the function. So we can say tilde num equals tilde func dot value. All right, so this is a pretty, uh, pretty as an understatement, useless function here. It does exactly one thing the same every time. What if we wanted to do this calculation times 4 minus 1 with an arbitrary value? Right? How do we, we want to pass a value in. A function is like a little black box, which has an input and an output. We want to be able to pass anything in, and we get something out. To do that, uh, we can't use a variable declaration. A variable declaration is it's useful. You know, if we have lots of things we want to keep track of and we want to give them names. But uh, specifically what we need to do here is declare a slightly different type of declaration, an argument. Uh, we're going to call this um, input. And we actually, uh, actually, no, we'll just call it num. And we're going to get rid of this variable declaration. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's redundant to have an argument and a variable representing the same thing. We, we don't need both. Um, 
but specifically this, this argument declaration defines an input for this function. And so now we can pass in a value by providing that value in parentheses immediately following the value method. So this gives us 23, 7 should give us 27, right? So this is, a, this is one of these fundamental behaviors of SuperCollider where we define some process. In this case, it does not make sound. It doesn't really do anything interesting, but the concept should be clear, and you should be able to extrapolate from this concept. Right? You define a function which has a name. It has one or more input arguments, and uh, we can then, and we're also making a distinction between defining some process and executing some process. Right? Here we define it. Here we actually say, do the thing that you do, right? go. Um, so now we can pass all sorts of values in. Um, you know, it's perfectly valid in this case to work with floating point numbers, like 3.5 or something like that. Right? Any sort of value can go in and comes out. Uh, OK, any questions so far? Rafi. There is a small syntax shortcut, and uh, this is unique to the value method. You can just remove the word value. Right? So function period, and then in parentheses. That is a syntactical equivalent. Without the period, you're going to get some sort of error message. Right? You do need that period. Yeah, SuperCollider is loaded with syntax shortcuts, so much so that there's actually quite a bit of inconsistency from time to time in help documents. And there's just, for, for instance, another one which you'll probably see all the time is there is a shortcut for uh, declaring an argument. Instead of argnum, you just uh, provide a pair of pipes and the name. It's pipes, it's a shift, it's the, the key right above your return character. It's that vertical line. I think they're called pipes. All right, so um, yep, we, we, again, this exact same thing. It's just a, a different syntax. <coughs> uh, I'd like to take a few steps back and talk about the help documentation again and just how to sort of navigate it. So uh, you can click the cube at any time to come back to this home page. And on the home page, you can go to a search and search for a method or an object or just type, you know, oscillator. And then a whole bunch of things that are that include the word oscillator or related to the word oscillator pop right up. Uh, browse gives you a categorical way of navigating. Um, you might find some interesting things here. But um, uh, what I usually find myself doing is um, clicking on something, like click on the word value here, and then Command D will automatically search for what the cursor is touching. So this, uh, it says it found the method value, and it's defined for these classes. Uh, another, another useful keyboard shortcut is Shift-Command-D. It brings up a little floating search bar. And so here I'm just going to type the word function with a capital F and hit Enter. And that searches for that term, and it found the help file for the function class. Um, the general structure of these help files is it gives you the name. It gives you a couple of very brief descriptions. Usually there's a description paragraph, and there are inline code examples throughout. And then you'll usually find a section of class methods and instance methods. Um, sometimes I start this class by giving a sort of deeper philosophical discussion about what is a class, what is, what is an instance of a class. Uh, and I, I just think because it's such a musically oriented language, these are things that Either you don't really need to know right now, or you will just naturally pick up on as you go. Um, if you find yourself running into lots of error messages, um, you know, I am your professor. I'm here to help. So really, do not be shy about asking questions and sending code. If you, you know, don't, don't feel like I should really know this, I should be able to figure this out. I've been using SuperCollider for about 12 years, and it took me, like, I don't know, eight to feel like re really start to feel comfortable and confident. And of course, I didn't have a class to take. I was kind of on my own. So um, yeah, just uh, keep that in mind. 
so uh, on the on the notion of classes, we, we are dealing with some classes already. For example, these numbers are instances of the integer class. Integer is a class of objects. Uh, float is another numerical class. Uh, so 3.5 is a float. Anything involving a decimal point is a float. And you can check what kind of class something is by sending it the class method. You can see 14.class gives us integer. 14.0.class uh, is a float. Right? And a few, of the, a few of the most common classes you are likely to encounter, in addition to integer and float, are string. A string is an array of characters, or uh, usually just called care, C-H-A-R. It's another common class. Uh, strings are delineated with, delineated with an enclosure of uh, double quotes. Right? It can be any, any characters, numbers, letters, whatever. So if we say this.class, we get string. Uh, a care is preceded by the dollar sign. So dollar lowercase i, that is in fact the character, lowercase i. Character, not actually used that commonly, at least not in my line of work. There's also symbol. And there are two ways to delineate a symbol. One is with, uh, let's just say symbol, say sim, is with single quotes. And the other is with a backslash. I'm being very messy here and not doing semicolons at the end of my lines. You've probably noticed already, maybe you've noticed already that if you just have a single line you actually don't need a semicolon. It won't complain. I kind of sort of sometimes wish it did complain at you because it, it encourages messy behavior to just be able to write a single line. But uh, you know that's, that's really neither here nor there. So a uh, symbol is like a string in that it can contain an unbroken set of uh, characters, but uh, a few things aren't allowed. I don't think you can put uh, certain characters in here. Uh, it's, it's a little tricky, but the, the main difference between symbols and strings is that strings have a size. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16. Did I get that right? So we can say dot size. Right. This contains 16 characters. Symbols are sizeless. They're always size 0. These are kind of just semantical details here. It's really uh, not, not too important. But strings and symbols in particular pop up all the time. They're used in a lot of cases for just naming things. Right? Things need a name, and the name needs to be provided as a string or a symbol. And then there is the array. The array is uh, an object which is an ordered collection of things. Some programming languages uh, Arrays have to contain all the same type of thing, all integers, all floats, something like that. Not in SuperCollider. An array can contain any number of any type of thing. So we will create my array. And we'll just put a 1 in there. We'll put the string high. We'll put a 3.5. We'll put a 7. We'll put the symbol there. And negative. 12.001. And there we go. We have an array. So arrays are ordered collections. Uh, this is kind of a silly example, but there are lots of much more meaningful examples where we use an array to store a collection of frequencies or a collection of amplitudes or a collection of audio files or, or something, something along those lines. So it's, uh, it's good to get comfortable with uh, manipulating arrays, knowing how to address them, how to add to them, how to take things away, how to scramble their order, perhaps. Um, so, and there's a lot of shortcuts as well involved with arrays. Um, let's let's make um, uh, another array here, um, nums, and we're just going to put um, 10, 20, 30. No, let's do uh, 100, 101. Uh, I, I'm so indecisive. Let's see. All the numbers are so great, I just can't pick the one that I want. Okay, so here's an array containing four numbers. 
first of all, being able to access items is really important. Um, so we have the array stored in the container nums. If I want to know um, what's the first item, I can say dot at and then provide the numerical index. And here's something to keep in mind, particularly if programming is kind of new to you. We count starting at zero. Zero is the first thing, first, which makes the word first really terrible for describing them. So sometimes you'll hear me say the zeroth item. Um, so the, the leftmost item in this array, the one which was put in there at the beginning, has index zero. So we can say, what is at index zero in nums? And we get 150. Index one contains 190, right? Index two. And if we try to look somewhere else, we don't actually get an error, but it says, it gives us the value nil, which is a special value for things that don't exist or things that haven't yet been given a value. Uh, so, you know, of course, my array, if we want, you know, we're, um, if we want to get that symbol, what index is, is the symbol there? Right. And we can say dot class. What kind of thing is that index for? It's a symbol. Right. So you can chain these methods together into longer composite expressions. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a syntax shortcut which instead of dot at, you can just say nums and then square brackets, oops, sorry, like this. These two expressions here are syntactically equivalent. We're accessing the item at index two. Um, there are so many methods for arrays. Um, and just to give you a very, uh, you know, sort of a quick, sample here, um, you can reverse the contents of the array. Um, you can scramble to mix them up. Um, and if you th scroll down in the array help file, you'll see, if you go down to where it says um, instance methods, for example, here's at, we just saw at, it's accessing an item. Uh, you can put something, basically replace something at a particular index. You can insert something between two indices. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. <coughs> Note that a lot of these array methods do not actually alter the receiver. They don't actually alter the array that receives the message. They return a modified array but they don't overwrite the existing array. So even though we've said reverse the array and then mix all the items up, the original array is exactly as we had it originally. Um, if we actually want to change this array, um, does anyone know how we would do that? We actually want my array to be a scrambled version of itself. Right. The same thing we did uh, up here, right? We set number equal to the result of the function, right? If we want to actually capture something, we can say my array equals my array dot scramble. And this is uh, what you might call a, a destructive operation, right? Because we, we've, we've ruined it, right? <laughs> it was all nice in some specific order and now it's, it's all mixed up. Um, you don't have to use the same name. You can use a different name, and that, that way you have a new named container, which is the scrambled version, and the old one, which is unaltered. But there are cases where you actually want to process some item sequentially and overwrite its container with the new results. And so that's something we frequently see in, in sound examples. You start with some sine wave, and then you do something to it, and you just overwrite the old container, and you overwrite, 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 rather than having to declare like 20 variables, one for each step. Right? So there are cases where it makes sense to just overwrite it. Okay. Let's make a little bit of sound in the last bit of class here. So, Super Collider looks like one program, and in a sense it is, but it's actually technically three different programs in one. One is the IDE, it's the environment in which you do your coding. Another one is called SCLang, S-C-L-A-N-Z. That's the, the sort of the proper programming language part of Super Collider. It's the interpreter, it's all the classes, it's all the methods, um, it's what lets you run and evaluate code. And, 
And uh, that's basically invisible. It's just running in the background. Um, and then there's also SC synth, S-C-S-Y-N-T-H. And that is also called the audio server. It's the program that does the sound. So if we want to make sound in Super Collider, the absolute first thing we must do is boot the audio server. And S, as I mentioned earlier, should return localhost. When you run it, localhost means the, it's the name given to the instance of SC synth running on your local computer. And the method to boot the server is s.boot. So go ahead and run this line, and you should see the post window come to life and throw a bunch of information at you. And the numbers in the bottom right-hand corner should turn from white to green. Green numbers? Green numbers? Yes? Show of hands? Green numbers? Were you two able to boot the server successfully? Oh, the sample rate? Yeah, so what you should do is um, go to um, audio MIDI setup. Do you know how to get there? Yep. And you'll want to um, look at the two devices that are being used for, see right now I have Motu Mono and Loopback Audio, and they're both running at the same sampling rate. So those, that's probably the problem, is that one of them is running at a different sampling rate. And Super Collider needs its input and output hardware to be running at the same rate. So if you make those the same rate, that you should be able to boot the server. Okay, so we've already seen functions, and we've seen that we can define a function and then call value on it to actually make it do the thing that it's supposed to do. We also use functions for defining sound processes. And usually, I like to call these UGen functions. That's capital U, capital G, lowercase e, lowercase n. UGen is a class of objects, which basically is, represents things that do stuff with signals, right? Signal generators, signal processors, signal calculators. And so we're gonna make the world's simplest UGen function. It's gonna be sine osc.ar. Let's do 200. <laughs> uh, and see if I can uh, sort of talk my way through this. Um, we've already seen that um, some methods like at, right, require some sort of input. And you can't just say nums at doesn't make sense. It's an incomplete sentence. We need to know what index you want to look something up at. So these unit generators are similar. We, we provide the class of some object we want to create. SinOSC is a sinusoidal oscillator. Dot AR tells SuperCollider, I'd like this to run at the audio rate. AR, audio rate. It just means produce 44,100 samples or whatever your sample rate is per second. And then it needs to know some information. And if you just press the left parenthesis, you'll see a little pop-up text. And it tells you these are the values I need to know, a frequency, an initial phase, uh, something called mull, and something called add. So frequency should be self-explanatory, how many cycles per second. Phase is a value measured in radians. It, it tells the sine wave where within its cycle it should start. It doesn't really matter in this particular case because it's going to be going at really, really fast. So in some cases it matters, but we can ignore phase. Mull is a value that is multi multiplied by every sample. And add is a value that is added to every sample. If that doesn't make sense, we will, we will get to it, uh, if not today, um, next week. So let's just say um, 200, 0, uh, 0 0.2, 0. OK? And we're going to close this out. And we're going to call this my sound. Uh, I don't know what this is. Ignore these warnings. Something's going on with my original super collider. I've probably broken it at some point. So we have a function. It's got a name, and it contains one sine wave, which is running at 200 cycles per second. And the mull value is 0.2. And I do this to scale everything down by a factor of 0.2 so that it is not too loud. And so now what we're going to say is um, uh, x equals my sound dot play. And before you run this line, uh, you should take a moment to burn into your brain the keyboard shortcut command period, control period. Command period for Mac, control period for Windows. That is the magic keyboard shortcut.
that does many, many things that are very, very helpful. One is it removes all sound processes from the server, so it's a hard stop for sound. It does a lot of other things too, but that's the important thing that it does. So um, that's one way to stop the sound. So go ahead and run this, and then press command period. 200 is a nice mellow frequency. There are lots of frequencies that will make you much less happy. All right, so we define a UGen function, we play it, and we store the resulting process in the interpreter variable x. And then we press command period. If you want, you can play around with different frequencies, like 300. And then maybe uh, think to yourself, wh how would I, um, you know, is, is there a way? Well, actually, no, it's, it's a little bit different. I was thinking, what if you want to pass in your own frequency? Uh, well, I think we'll do that, and then we'll wrap up for the day. Um, instead of command period, you can actually free the resulting process. So this would work as well. Right. It's a hard stop. It's not very elegant, but it does get the job done. If you want to uh, be able to specify your own frequency in the function, we declare some argument right, with our pipes, or you can do arg freak semicolon. And then here, it's a little bit different. After play, we don't just put in the value we want. I think we actually have to say arg colon, and then an array containing a symbol representing the name of the argument, and then the value of the argument. Oh, that didn't work. I think I didn't run this. Aha! Okay. So I'll let you uh, digest this for, for just a minute. Here's our boring version that always plays 300 hertz. And here's a, a nicer version where we can actually generate, uh, you know, a tone we want. And let's just get a little bit messy here. And... Let's just, uh, we'll run this line multiple times with a different value. Okay. And I'm already starting to sort of overload the meters a little bit. Um, but it just, the, the point of this, of just demonstrating what I just did, is to show you that it's a very dynamic environment, right? It's, you don't, you're not forced to have just one sound happening at a time. You can very dynamically create a sound, another sound, maybe an entirely different type of oscillator, maybe a noise generator, maybe some processing effect. And you can dynamically add and remove things from the audio server. OK, so um, that is most of what I wanted to get through today. Uh, plenty more where that came from. Uh, so what I will do is. Um, this afternoon, this evening, I'm going to check over the first problem set, and I will put it on the course website in um, a new module, and that'll be due at the start of class next week. Um, uh, before we go, does anyone have any questions? The shortcut for what? Oh, indentation. You select everything, Command A, and then just press the tab button, tab key. Right. Uh, you're probably, probably, your brain tells you, no, don't, you're going to overwrite all your text with a tab character, but it, it's, it's a smart program. It, it knows. It's, so just select everything and then tab. Okay. Yes, Rafi. You mean, can you force them to only contain one type of data? I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't know why you'd want to do that. Um, I mean, maybe I guess to save memory or something like that, right? It's probably more efficient. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you can just put integers in there and pretend that they can only take integers. But I, I think it's, it's a sort of a higher level language. You know, you don't have to declare the type of thing you're declaring. You don't have to say care this, int that, right? So it's just not a very, um, um, yeah, it's not a very picky language in that sense. There is a thing called literal arrays, and those can't be changed once you've made them. They're not dynamic like arrays. But I think the answer is no. I don't think you can force Super Collider to make a type-specific array. Yeah. 
Okay, well, um, that'll be it. So I'm going to dismiss you all. If you want to stick around and ask questions, that's fine too. All right, thank you. See you next week.